Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Frenti seminar series uh, organized by the Global Frenti Network. Uh, today we have uh, a distinguished uh, uh, presenter, and I will, uh, in a few minutes, introduce him. Uh, but first, uh, I'd like to, to uh, I guess, have discuss some housekeeping issues before we get started, and briefly, uh, mainly uh, to say that. Uh, I will do the introductions, but at the end we'll have at the end of the presentation we'll have time for questions and answers. And if you decide to do that, please use the chat uh, feature in WebEx, and you can start doing that during the presentation. So then we are uh, ready for for the round of of questions and answers at the end. Uh, we'll be recording this session, so for those of you that would like to see it again, uh, we'll send. The, the links and there we in our uh, YouTube channel with uh, all the other presentations that we have from the first three years of the Frenti seminar series. Uh, and, and we hope you join us. And then in a few minutes, I'll give you some more information about the next uh, Frenti seminar series uh, in July. That will be actually a, a, a group discussion a panel uh, on geroscience interventions. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker and let me get my notes here. So I'm, and it's a pleasure of course, to have today uh, our uh, presenter, Dr. Prof Dr. and Professor Liang Kun Cheng. Professor Chen obtained his medical degree from the National Yangming University in 1996 and went on later to obtain a PhD focused on aging and public policy. In 2005, he was appointed as a visiting scholar in the Department of Clinical Gerontology at the University of Oxford in the UK. In 2006, Professor Chen became the director of the Center for Geriatrics and Gerontology at Taipei Veterans General Hospital, where he developed innovative solutions for older people's healthcare needs. In 2014, he was appointed as the director of the Aging and Health Research Center at the National Yang Ming University, which was later renamed as the Center for Healthy Longevity and Aging Sciences. <clears throat> Professor Chen is a prolific researcher. He's published nearly 450 peer review articles in leading journals. His research covers frailty and sarcopenia, aging and metabolism, age-friendly healthcare, and smart healthcare and artificial intelligence. Professor Cheng is actively engaged in international collaborations for research and healthcare reforms for older people and serves as an editor for several prestigious international academic journals and actively explores what is actually a very timely topic, uh, artificial intelligence applications for healthy aging, and collaborates with computer science experts internationally. So thank you, Dr. Chen, for joining us, and, and we are glad to have you today in the Friendly Seminar Series. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, no matter which time zone you're from, so I'm hoping to share with you with this topic today is mainly on focus, but a focus on frailty. The, sub the subtitle of my presentation will focus on the precision approach and multi-domain intervention. So. Uh, this is me, but uh, it has been introduced very well, much more than the information I provided. Okay, um, that I think the whole uh, topic of this activity, activity is mainly the frailty. So I assume everybody knows about frailty, and it must have been introduced for several times. But uh, if you're looking at the very beginning, uh, as clinicians, we know uh, we probably know in clinical presentation about frailty, but that's very much subjective perspective, perspective because when you're seeing a patient, no matter what diagnosis it is, you will feel this patient is particularly vulnerable or frail. And then you will tell your colleague when you're taking the night shift, you have to be careful, something like that. And this is a very subjective feeling. And, but, uh, as a geriatrician, more and more you know, this is a special condition. So then people would like to more objectively describe it and then to develop a diagnostic criteria. 
So uh, if you look at the literature, there are several different, in, in the early stage, there are several different terms trying to describe frailty. So maybe in the beginning, very early stage, people th just mentioned uh, frailty is a very slippery meaning. Uh, people know it is there, but it's hard to get a very um, universal definition at that time. And if you search uh, the, the, the pop map or the mesh term, there are several different um, meaning linking to frailty. So generally speaking, uh, people saying, uh, or the researchers saying people with frailty is uh, about lacking in the strengths or the, the, they're generally speaking, they're, they're usually susceptible to disease. And um, sometimes people would describe frailty is kind of a vulnerability. And uh, those frail older people are less likely to cope with the stressors. And they, are, they may have uh, impending or current existing uh, disability. And there are so many other different terms. They're trying to describe uh, what frailty is. And gradually people, if you're from your gerontological researcher or your clinician, you may see different pictures. And in clinical geriatrics, many, many clinicians describe frailty uh, is a combination with multiple complex co coexisting medical conditions. Because when they see a frail older person, they also see a lot of different coexisting condition. And not only physical, but also mental, even social uh, dimensions. So it's a very complex conditions. But gradually, after decades of discussion, people gradually get some feeling about frailty. Then uh, people move on trying to develop a, a operational definition for frailty. So before we have an um, operational definition, generally speaking, what, what does frailty really imply? So first, it's an age-related condition. And second, it is a kind of a vulnerable state. And the patient may have uh, less uh, likely to cope with the stressors because they're short of their uh, physiological reserve and they are more likely to develop disability and mortality. And one important thing is frailty could be potentially reversible. So it is a condition that needs a lot of attention. And there are several different definitions that I believe you have heard that before, but here I would like to focus on one uh, single operational definition, which is the physical frailty. And the Johns Hopkins team, uh, Professor Linda Free, they, they uh, proposed this operational definition back in 2001. So uh, physical frailty can be described based on the five elements. One is slowness, weakness, exhaustion, weight loss, and inactivity. And if you have nothing about the five, it, you're robust. You have one or two items, you're pre-frail. You have uh, three or above. Uh, elements you're frail. And they develop this model. They're trying to know whether those this model can really predict adverse outcomes like falls, disability, mortality. And they use their cohort, the, the cardiovascular health study. And they, they found that, yes, this uh, model, uh, physical frailty, can predict adverse outcomes. And the robust pre-frailty and frailty shows that those responsive effects so this is quite clear that we know uh, this definition, uh, physical frailty, can um, match our previous uh, discussion and our understanding about frailty, especially to predict adverse outcome. But it's not a very simple question because uh, when you look at the, this um, definition, like uh, when we're talking about metabolic syndrome, so you just taking three out of the five elements. Are they all the same? It is a very interesting question. And especially in the pathophysiology of the uh, frailty, when you're someone is going to develop uh, frailty, like you can see in the middle, in the clinical phenotype, when someone had weakness, slowness, and fatigue, and he or she is qualified to be frailty, but it can be older adult age. 
who has multiple comorbid conditions like a congestive heart failure, hypothyroidism, and sarcopenia. And each one can be linked to the, uh, each element of the physical frailty. But on the other hand, if you look at the right-hand side, the older adult B, who has a severe depression alone, can match with all those three phenotypic uh, presentations of frailty. Not to mention when the patient take the antidepressant can also the side effect of the uh, antidepressant can also lead to fatigue or other components of frailty. So uh, when you're seeing a person with frailty, eventually it can come from many different um, uh, beginnings. It is a little bit difficult for us to harmonize uh, the uh, underlying etiology of each uh, frail older adults. So let's do some mathematics. If you look at uh, that uh, definition of uh, physical frailty, you're taking, you randomly pick three out of the five elements or four or five. How many combinations can it be? The answer is 16. So based on the definition of physical frailty, uh, theoretically, there should be 16 different combinations to qualify as the diagnosis of physical frailty. But are they all the same? Or can each element be presented independently from the others? Because uh, like metabolic syndrome, it's the same. When you randomly pick up three out of five and saying that they're all the same condition like metabolic syndrome or frailty, the basic very fundamental assumption is the presence of each element is statistically independent. They do not cluster with each other. But usually in a biological science or in the human study, it's not the case. So that, that is why we need a lot more uh, deeper thinking uh, linking to the uh, precision health. Mm, in the human history, when we're studying medicine, like um, the adenocarcinoma of lung, so we first subtype lung cancer patient based on their cell types. So the non-small cell uh, lung cancer, small cell, and, and non-small cell lung cancer can be di uh, divided into adenocarcinoma or squamous square cell carcinoma. So we treat patients based on those classifications. But nowadays, because of you have better technology, you, you can do the cancer cell genotyping. So even in the arena of adenocarcinoma, you can get very different players in the arena but they are all so-called adenocarcinoma of lung. But nowadays, due to the genotyping, you can subtype the, all those uh, different adenocarcinoma of lung and provide different target therapy to get uh, different therapeutic effects. So that's the principle of uh, uh, precision medicine, but it can be applied to either precision health or the precision prevention or the precision principle can be applied to those phenotypes or the, the elements of the physical frailty. So for us to tell, if to differentiate if there's any specific subtypes of the physical frailty. So in the precision house, uh, there are two uh, important principles. One is classification and the clustering. So you can see from this uh, figure that you can classify different animals based on biology, so you know they're different. But on the other hand, some animals, they tend to uh, show up together. So it's kind of clustering phenomenon. A and B usually come out together. So uh, that's two different types. You can do classification to see each different class have different uh, outcomes. And also you can check the different clustering uh, the different clusters, because the different clusters, they may be interrelated based on either genetics or environment factors they, that make them a cluster. And this cluster can generate different outcomes. So that is the principle for us to do the uh, precision process. 
So it is very important because if you look at the uh, general population, like let's say uh, lung cancer, you say, well, we, I see the lung cancer patient. So I try to implement all the lung cancer treatment to this, all the patients, but eventually you know they are different. So nowadays we have different cell types. So we can differentiate people into different groups. And why the differentiation is important? Because when you differentiate them and you introduce the treatment, so you can get different results. So you can look at the, the green one, the green part, that the healthcare treatment is effective and has very minimum adverse effects. So this is a perfect scenario. But if you look at the, the red uh, part, the healthcare uh, the treatment is not effective and also have very uh, active side effects. So if you don't differentiate these people into different groups and you simply introduce the, uh, the, the same treatment or the same, uh, even the health promotion activities, none of them will get the same results. So we're uh, based on this principle, we're hoping to get a more uh, precision approach for the uh, very complex uh, aging process uh, in the phenotypic way of physical frailty. So let's apply this principle to a real world cohort. So this is a cohort of our uh, study. So we use the data driven approach to classify uh, frailty. So that is the way to look at the clustering phenomenon. We use the latent cost analysis. And then, so we, we found that basically all our uh, participants has been classified into four groups. And group number one is robust. So, so we don't talk about it here. And the other three groups, the main, the, 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 the biggest, the most important uh, cluster is the, the one where I call it mobility frailty. That uh, is the clustering of slowness and weakness, which means when someone has uh, slow walking speed, he usually has a weak hand grip strength as well. And the second type is uh, non-mobility frailty. And it's a clustering between uh, fatigue and uh, weight loss. And the other, and the number three is a relatively independent uh, cluster called in inactivity. So that subject does not have other components, just inactivity. So based on the data-driven approach, so all our cohort sample can be divided into this group, but that's the statistic approach. What's the difference between them? I mean, in the clinical characteristic or outcomes. So we look at their clinical presentation and their lab data and the outcomes. So we found that mobility frailty uh, subject, they are older and they are thinner. They have lower bone mineral density. They have lower um, skeletal muscle mass and they have more multimobility. They are more malnourished and they have poor cognitive performance and they have higher mortality risk. If you look at this, you will think about the underlying pathophysiology may linked with a neuromuscular skeletal system. And you look at the non-mobility uh, frailty, and they are younger, they are bigger, they have higher cardiometabolic risk, and they are more depressed. So the underlying pathophysiology may involve cardiometabolic system and the mood disorder. So this differentiate people in different uh, pathophysiology and the clinical presentation in phenotypes uh, in the aging process. And uh, in our study, we also found they have different mortality risk. But the question is in the epidemiological study, when you classify those people, you do not know their incubation period for that symptom. Someone who had the slowness for one year and for 10 years, they may represent different status. So to solve this problem, we have to use a bigger sample, uh, which follows for a longer period of time. So we work with Japanese uh, National Center for Geriatrics and Gerontology. They have a 16-year uh, cohort. So we obtain a sample in the beginning that are all robust. 
So starting from robust and observe for 10 years, uh, looking at their uh, progressive uh, presentation about the phenotype, uh, about the physical frailty in all the components. So the answer is uh, all those robust individuals, along with aging, they gradually develop into mobility frailty, non-mobility frailty. And the same, the mobility frailty subject are uh, uh, gradually having more multimobility and have uh, uh, worsened cognitive performance. So this better design also echoes the previous, uh, the, the finding from our cohort. So this phenomenon really exists, uh, which is validated by international cohorts and using two different types of data-driven approach. Uh, we use the latent cost analysis. In the Japanese cohort, we use the, the uh, the group-based trajectory modeling, which is uh, when you have multiple uh, measurements. And some data from the United States also show the similar things. So they, they would like to know whether all components of the uh, physical frailty can lead to the risk of cognitive uh, decline. The answer is no. Not every, not every, not all the components act the same. Only slowness, weakness, and weight loss can predict uh, subsequent cognitive declines. So this is quite compatible with our finding. The main uh, predictor is slowness and weakness. So uh, based on our study and our uh, previous research, we're trying to capture the, the, the risk, trying to, to capture the risk of this cluster uh, of mobility and cognitive decline. So there are several different approaches in the world, and we use the term, we, we named it as a physio-cognitive decline syndrome. We think this is a subtype of uh, frailty, and this subtype uh, means a lot because the patient had, uh, the, the, the subject has a concomitant physical and cognitive decline in the aging process. There are several different proposals, like a cognitive frailty, or motoric cognitive risk syndrome, um, we are saying pretty much the same phenomenon, but we are using different operational definition. That uh, it may take some, it take a lot of time to do a better explanation. But we'd like to focus on this phenomenon that someone who had uh, concomitant physical and cognitive declines, because in the physical frailty, it does not. Uh, include the element of cognitive performance. But in the data analysis, through a data-driven approach, you can see that uh, those who had a mobility frailty, they usually have poor cognitive performance. Although it is not included in the definition, it is there. So we try to define this, this group of people uh, using mind and the mobility impairment, no disability. So which means slowness and or weakness and signed cognitive impairment, no dementia. So it's something, the concept like the, um, the uh, MCI. And so by, by capturing this uh, specific subtype, we're hoping this subtype can predict mortality, incident disability, and incident dementia. And the first thing in the eight-year observation, we see that PCDS is a progressive condition. As people getting older, uh, the, the, the prevalence of PCDS or each individual component, especially mind, were getting increased uh, over time. And it predicts mortality. And the, on the left-hand side is the old cause of mortality. Uh, right-hand side is the cost-specific mortality using two different cohorts from Taiwan. And using our Japanese colleagues' cohort, we can see that the PCDS predicts incident disability and incident dementia. So this subtype is pretty important because it predicts the most unfavorable, our, that they, they catch our most attention, the unfavorable uh, outcomes of aging, which is mortality, disability, and dementia. So when you can identify those people, then you can go deeper looking for the uh, biomarkers or even the genomics or the others, trying to find out the specific underlying pathophysiology or even the specific, uh, it could be a specific disease 
And so in our cohort, everyone received a 3T brain MRI. So you can see on the top row uh, that is a healthy, robust individual. And in the, in the middle is the middle age PCDS uh, subject. And in the lower row is the, uh, the, the older uh, PCDS uh, subject. And you can see the red dots of the brain. The, every red dot uh, indicates the atrophy of the gray matter. So you can see that when there is uh, more red dots, means that there is a more gray matter deficit. And you can see that in the older PCDS subject compared with the normal, they have a lot of um, uh, gray matter deficit, especially focused on cerebellum, uh, basal ganglia, li uh, limbic system, including uh, amygdala and hippocampus. When you look at the middle age PCDS, basically the structure does not really change a lot. That makes sense because it could be early, so it is a, it is a functional abnorm abnormality. So the structure still remain intact, but gradually over time, the volume starting to get uh, atrophied. So, well, it could be an interesting finding for the, for the neuroimaging biosignature. So especially the gray matter deficit of linking uh, cerebellum, uh, limbic system, hippocampus, and amygdala. But the question is, how can someone be so unlucky that at the same time, your cerebellum, hippocampus, and amygdala get becoming atrophic? That does not really make sense if they are not connected. So we use the DTI technology uh, to identify if there is a potential neural circuit uh, between those uh, lesions, and the answer is positive, that there is a cerebellum limbic neural circuit link all those regions together. And this is from imaging. And uh, I think it's two or three years ago, a team in UC Davis, they're using the animal to, to prove the existence of this uh, neural circuit. So it could be a special neural circuit, uh, neural imaging biomarker for this phenomenon or for this subtype of frailty. And we also have studies trying to find out could, uh, could the atrophic muscle fiber uh, secrete some negative regulator to induce uh, neurosenescence. Otherwise, uh, how, can, how can we link with uh, the uh, mobility and the cognition together. It's not just top down from the central uh, nervous system to the peripheral skeletal muscle. So skeletal muscle nowadays has, has been considered as the biggest endocrine organ in our body. So it can secrete a lot of different myokines uh, to different organs. It could also secrete something to the brain. So uh, our study is quite a complex design, but anyway, we did, find, we did find that the atrophic muscle fiber can secrete uh, some negative uh, regulators uh, using uh, as the exosomal form uh, to the brain. And we focused on the microRNA and we identified, we compared the cell culture and the human sample. Uh, we found that the, uh, the microRNA mirror to be 29B3P eventually can be secreted into the circulation. And we, we use this microRNA to treat the IPS uh, generated human neuron cell, and it will accelerate the neurosenescence. So, which means uh, the, the mobility, the musculoskeletal muscle, and the cognition and the neurons, they eventually are interconnected with some special uh, pathways. But we know all those things, but Let's look at the current treatment for, for frailty. What, what's the major intervention of frailty? So people may talk about exercise, which is very, very important. But uh, you look at a recent paper, um, a recent meta-analysis, trying to explore uh, the, the clinical efficacy of frailty intervention. The answer is very negative, that um, for the, the for this meta-analysis, they collect the randomized trials, and they found that uh, those frailty intervention, if um, they cannot reach the uh, our assumption to reduce mortality, reduce hospitalization, or reduce disability. And but you look at 
the the table over here, you can see that um, that that I take um, mortality as an example, but the other uh, indicators are quite similar. And the question of this meta analysis is that in every individual study, the definition, the concept, or the uh, assessment tool or the treatment protocols of frailty differ greatly. Although researchers say we're doing frailty intervention, but eventually every frailty addressed by individual researchers are different. Somebody use uh, uh, physical frailty, somebody use frailty index, somebody use other modified criteria. Somebody use exercise, somebody use only case management as the intervention. So it's quite diverse, quite heterogeneous. So they may uh, their generates inconclusive um, uh, message for all the frailty intervention uh, to the overall outcomes. And at the same time, because when you see a frail older adult, older adults, there are multiple comorbid conditions like polypharmacy, depression, cognitive uh, impairments, or others. So you could not possibly reverse all those conditions by using one single uh, intervention program like exercise. You probably have, have to cover more dimensions. So we should try to um, to 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 develop certain multi-domain intervention to see whether we can cover uh, different uh, elements uh, in the frailty development process so that we can reverse the condition. So here are two uh, national randomized trials we've done before. And the first one uh, is more focused on health promotion. It's a multi-domain health promotion intervention. So we um, enroll people from the community with uh, age over 65 who is at least pre-frail. And uh, we introduced the, uh, the multi-domain intervention uh, in the first part of the study we call efficacy study. Uh, it's trying to build out the model. So the multi-domain intervention uh, includes 40 minutes exercise and 20 minutes uh, aerobic, 20 minutes uh, resistance and also 40 minutes of cognitive training. So that has to include four different dimensions of the cognitive domains, like, like uh, memory, attention, abstract thinking, and so on. And 10 minutes uh, nutritional consultation and 10 minutes health education. For every session is two hours. So in the first month, we were, were hoping the participant to getting used to it. For in the first month, the session is delivered once a week. The second month is is uh, is once every other week, and from the third month on to the twelfth month, we only introduce the session once a month, because we we're hoping the uh, participant they have the habit to do all those things at home, and then we follow the result for the for the twelfth year uh, for the twelfth month, and the second part of the study we call this empowerment study. So when we know this model works, where we want to know whether other uh, uh, intervention can further boost the results. So something like using the wearable devices or using some uh, intergroup comparisons or the competitions, can they do better at home to enhance their motivation? So the second part of the empowerment study is we took the intervention arm in the efficacy study to become the control arm in the empowerment study. And the, the intervention arm of the empowerment study is the intervention plus wearable devices and some uh, in, uh, intra and intergroup competitions. And the result is basically positive. That first thing, uh, people are lazy. Uh, this is the first impression because a lot of indicators are making significant improvement in the six months from the baseline. But the, the benefit gradually decline, decay over time to the 12 months, which means when those sessions are delivered more frequently, so the benefit is bigger. 
but when we trust the participant to go back home doing the things on their own, they gradually reduce the intensity and the frequency. So the effect is declined, but overall the model is positive. So this multi-domain intervention improve uh, frailty, improve cognitive performance, and also improve nutrition. And it, the improvement in the cognition and the nutrition is relatively um, delayed. So uh, exercise uh, induced uh, improve the, the physical frailty parameters quite early, but nutrition and cognition is later, like between the 12, uh, the six to 12 months. And the right hand side is the uh, empowerment study. Empowerment study can can further enhance uh, the efficacy of the, uh, the the original intervention. So, which means the multi-domain intervention can improve the frailty status, cognitive performance, the, uh, the, the depressive symptoms, as well as nutritional status. So it covers uh, many different con contributing factors of frailty. So this could be a better solution for frailty intervention instead of single elements of those intervention. But in the real world, uh, we have to deal with the older person, not just with frailty, but they also have multi-mobility. And how could the healthcare system buy in your idea. So we done an, we, we did another randomized trial. And we focused on people with multi-mobility together with uh, frailty. And we and in the previous trial, it is a community-based uh, health promotion activities. So primary care physician is not involved. And there's no way to deal with polypharmacy or the inappropriate medication issue when a multi-mobile older adults must have a lot of uh, medication. So in this trial, we call it TIGER, Taiwan Integrated Geriatric Care Study. It is a partner study with FINGER. So the one done in Finland is called FINGER, and the one done in Singapore is called SINGER, and the one done in Taiwan, we call it TIGER. And uh, we work with a primary care physician, and the paper is published in the Lancet Health Longevity to show the efficacy of this uh, model. So the model is pretty much similar, but this time we add primary care physicians and who may be a geriatrician or not. But those who are not geriatricians will have a special education training for them, focus on the, uh, the integrated care and the uh, polypharmacy or the uh, person-centered care uh, to have those uh, primary care physicians get more focused on dealing with those multiple complex issues. And then the outcome assessment, not just for frailty, we measure uh, all the other related outcomes like quality of life is more holistic outcomes. And of course, measuring the physical function and the uh, cognitive performance as well. And in order for the healthcare system to take this uh, model, so we also measure the value-based healthcare metrics. So it is uh, uh, to test whether this is a, a cost-effective uh, model for the healthcare system reform. So in this study, we screen uh, like 630 cases. Uh, overall, nearly uh, 400 enter the study and being randomized. And after the study, uh, the control group, uh, we have a very good retention rate that almost 80% of the the, the case stay in the group and the intervention group is almost 90% and they are very well matched in the baseline characteristics. So let's look at the result that uh, we focus on the physical, uh, the quality of life. Uh, there is a physical component and a mental component. You can see they make significant improvement in the quality of life and both uh, physical and mental. And uh, we specifically focus on the cognitive performance. So every domain of the cognitive performance, uh, like, like a naming concentration language and others, they all making improvement. And in the uh, uh, value-based healthcare metrics, uh, there are three different tiers, stands for the immediate outcome, midterm and the long-term outcome. So this uh, model improved mainly on the long-term outcome, which is uh, a, a value-based healthcare principle. 
So that's quite compatible. So when we look at those uh, older adults with frailty, eventually the frailty can come from different factors and they are pretty much interrelated. Can be social, can be bio, and can, can be mental. Although we're trying to do the, pre the, the precision health principle, that help us to identify the specific uh, underlying etiology for us to get a better biomarker or a better uh, therapeutic approach to achieve the better uh, accuracy and the treatment efficacy. But on the other hand, we also have to, at this moment, to look at that um, frail order adults needs more comprehensive approach. So it's a balance between precision and the compre com compre uh, and the accuracy. The accuracy stands for uh, uh, we have to look at the person's the all the holistic needs. So it's not a conflict. It's a balance between precision and holistic. So the last slide will be like this. So to summarize, to summarize my presentation is how to balance between the accuracy and the precision. So you can look at here that uh, the previous meta-analysis shows that the current frailty intervention is not quite successful because we use different concepts, different assessment tool, different treatment. So we're not really hitting the target. So if you would, some, some models, some intervention may hit the target, but some others are not. So if you look at a general picture, you can say, well, you're not performing very well. It is not accurate, it's not precision. But if you focus very much on the precision, so you identify a specific cluster or a subtype of, uh, for, for the, the, the frailty presentation, but it's not the core. So although you identify a specific uh, subtype with strong clustering phenomena, it may not be linked to the adverse outcomes. So it may not be that important in terms of intervention. So if you just focus on precision, that may not make a big difference. Precision process has to be linked with the outcome. So the most ideal model nowadays could be, we try to balance between the accuracy and the uh, precision. We're trying to get more precise uh, to the core of this uh, uh, phenomenon we're, we're interested, which is frailty. But before you understand everything about frailty, try to be a little bit more holistic and comprehensive that to hit different related domains that we can generate a bigger and overall impact and improvement for frailty intervention. But in the future, uh, probably we're able to identify the real important, the real core of the biology in uh, frailty. At that time, we can develop very, very specific target therapy for uh, frailty. But that is uh, not yet achieved. So maybe in the future, we can probably we're able to do that, but at this time, maybe we have to balance between the accuracy and the precision trying to provide a most effective approach uh, for frailty intervention. So this is uh, my presentation regarding to the precision approach and the uh, multi-domain intervention for frailty intervention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lancun, for a, a great presentation. I think very uh, thought-provoking <laughs> uh, concepts uh, related to, to frailty and the management and and some of the explanations, I guess, for some of the failures or lack of success of other interventions. You mentioned a few. Mm -hmm. You're right. I think we, we are experiencing that. Probably, like, I think from my own summary, the definition of frailty that is probably the most accepted uh, by Linda Freed, uh, is not granular enough, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and that's why probably some people are inclined to use the frailty index, although it's not the same conceptualization, probably because there are more data points and, and, and there is something to be said. 
But uh, while we're waiting for some of the questions, I guess in in your own research or your review of the literature, how we know that, of course, lifestyle and control cardiovascular risk factors is key for prevention of frailty, for treatment of frailty, and cognitive impairment too. Uh, but have you I, seen the role of in these studies uh, be this, the investigation of the role of genetics? You know, knowing, for example, in 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 Alzheimer's, APOE4 is a one is probably one of the most important factor genetic factors, not the only one. Uh, and there is some association of frailty with APOE4. But are you aware of any genetics there that may may help us better personalize interventions for frailty? Well, uh, although I I I did. Uh, read some uh, literature regarding to genetics or uh, proteomics or metabolomics. I don't get a very good, you know, conclusive information for all those things together. And uh, uh, especially uh, for because you know the 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 genotypic differences, uh, it's not always being uh, translated into phenotype or some other specific mechanisms. So it need it's a long way to prove it's really the, the major uh, issues. But especially in the aging process, human, it's just, it is a complex interaction between gene and environment interaction. So not every gene can be expressed or not even the gene, the, the, the defective gene may eventually not showing any differences. So it's still difficult to conclude. And um, through the other omics study, that uh, even though we use some machine learning approach to do the analysis, still we only get some partial information that could be a biomarker, but very difficult to be to address the mechanistic uh, correlation. So I think this in this area we still need a lot of uh, research. I still don't have good uh, good uh, answer to your question, but I would say um, from our previous uh, research from the phenotypic presentation, there must be some subtypes or must some special presentation of this uh, the, the 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 accelerated aging process that both hitting physical and cognitive or other dimensions. And identifying those people and starting to dig in the potential mechanistic uh, correlation would be important to me. But I think there's still a long way to go. Right. Uh, I have another question. I have a lot of questions, but uh, one about your uh, variation of the finger study, the tiger that you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm glad to see that there is. Uh, of course, the geriatric flavor in in into that trial. Uh, are, you use their frailty as an outcome, is that right? Uh, so I assume that all the patients were robust to begin with. No, no. There are the the inclusion criteria is uh, they have at least three chronic conditions, and they're at least pre frail. Pre frail, so, right? Yeah, at least pre frail. So so we we pick up those. Uh, we think more challenging subject because they have multiple chronic condition plus functional impairment and and that shows the integrated uh geriatrician uh effort plus uh appropriate lifestyle modification which means the multi-domain intervention can improve the outcomes the outcome not only frailty frailty is part of them also quality of life because it has to be more holistic. You're doing a more holistic intervention, so you have to measure more holistic outcomes. So quality of life, frailty as well, county performance. And also you have to provide uh, inspiration for the uh, positive makers. So we use the uh, value-based healthcare metrics, trying to tell the positive maker that this one is a highly value. It's a, it's a, it's a service model with high value that all the healthcare system can try to adopt. Yes. Exactly. And that's uh, a major, major issue in not only in geriatric care or healthcare in general, is the issue of behavior. 
uh, and have to change behavior. And, and I think uh, you are praised for incorporating some measures that interventions that uh, I guess make use of uh, some of these conceptual frameworks on behavioral change. Uh, and can you comment on that? Because I think is that part of a specific psychological framework when you use, for example, the competition as part of the empowerment study, right? You use the competition as one of the, I guess, a behavior change tool. And there was another one, group of uh, the wearables, I guess, yeah, with yeah. the intention of giving them feedback, right? Yeah, yeah. So wearable is interesting that uh, when you are, uh, when, when you know uh, your activity is being recorded and that result can be shown to your group members, you do much better exercise. So when you, even though you're alone at home, so you are check the status every day and trying to reach the goal. And the intergroup competition is even better because, uh, well, if you join a group activity like uh, 10 people, but you have to, you know, if you, if you, we subdivide the 10 people into two groups, five versus five, and then we provide first small incentive that if you reach the goal, you can be working for more steps that you can get the reward and people getting much more engaged in activity. So it's not just about, you know, for the public policy issue. So it's not just about whether the model is effective or, or not. The implementation strategy also is very important. So we found that using a simple wearable device and some group competition that really enhanced the outcome. So, so that's also could be a reference for uh, every researchers or the clinicians when you are going to implement your model, you can do something uh, interesting design, very simple uh, uh, behavior changes or some mental or psychological uh, uh, inspiration for them to do more and more adhere to our goals in the intervention that could be much better improved. Exactly. I think uh, maybe because many of these interventions are designed by clinicians and physicians, many times we kind of neglect the fact that behavioral change is a psychological issue and, yeah. and we should always incorporate some kind of behavioral framework because uh, I just saw that with some of the reports on the false literature. I think JAMA, you probably saw that last paper from the United States Preventive Task Force that multi-domain interventions did not did reduce falls, but were not very effective in many other areas. And part of that is because it was difficult to adhere to the multi-domain intervention, right? True, 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 true. So, so we need some group leader and we need some, I think nowadays uh, digital technology, if, if, if people accept it, and I think digital, we have other studies showing interesting results that, uh, that even though you provide no intervention, only providing the wearable device, and those who regularly uh, send back the data means they are regularly doing health promotion. They're, they're in one year, they're all the health behavior and the physical function, cognitive function and mental function are improved. That would do nothing. We do nothing, we just provide it wearable. So those who, uh, willing to wear wearable and willing to provide feedback from the data. It's a good sign for the health behaviors. Exactly, exactly. And I think we have to incorporate more and more different modalities. You use two of them. Of course, there are, there are others <laughs> that may work because, and, and that brings me to the issue of, I guess, human beings are across ethnicities and nationalities are more similar than they are different. But at the same time, there are some cultural aspects. Could you yeah. comment on, on some of that? Because you probably have, you have collaborated with people all over the world, uh, mm -hmm. and certainly most of your research is in China and Asia, mm -hmm. but can you comment on the role of cultural differences uh, on behaviors and how in the implementation of these interventions? Ah, uh, there are many differences <laughs> that uh, one, uh, okay, there are at least three types of differences that we have to harmonize uh, during the cooperation. One is the, especially the, the, the dietary culture that people in different regions eat differently. It, it's 
it's very difficult to say, okay, let's let's do some principle. I mean, uh, in many Western diet, there you can say let's do the uh, mat diet or the dash diet. But in Asian cultures, the food is very different. It's hard to define what's the principle of the mat diet. Very difficult. So uh, and not you know it's not just. Uh, Western and Eastern, even in different Asian countries, they have different dietary patterns. So we have to harmonize based on the principle to see, to stick on one uh, or agreed principle in the dietary diversity, something. And uh, exercise is another issue that um, we all know the benefit of exercise, but uh, some countries, they have a different uh, culture perspective in that they, they would like maybe because the, the the climate so they usually have a lot of um, they become relatively inactive in most of the daytime because the the weather the climate things and some some uh some countries they spend uh some more time for the religious praying so a lot of act, uh, activity they cannot really adhere with it and one another challenge is for the cognitive performance intervention, it has to be culture sensitive because it's not reading the textbook. You are training people to use their brain to do some abstract thinking or do some logistic training. It's not just memory. So you have to adhere to their cultural principles. Otherwise, uh, they, they just cannot understand. So we get a very, in the beginning, we get a teaching material from France. But Europeans material cannot be applied to Asian culture. So we spend like half a year trying to generate our own material. So I think diet and the culture thing, especially in the cognitive training and the mental issue and some um, uh, religious and daily activity preference could really uh, alter the result of the uh, fixed intervention protocol. It's not like a drug trial. Drug trial, relatively easy, just take it. But the lifestyle modification is very complex. Thank you, Lankum, for a great presentation and a great discussion. And now I'd like to invite all our colleagues for uh, the next Fertility Seminar Series on July 10th. We'll have a, a webinar panel uh, on gerocytes interventions that will include three distinguished uh, female uh, uh, expert scientists, physicians uh, from uh, 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 Dr. Sa Dr. Sara Espinosa, who is uh, from the Center for Geroscience at Cedar Sinai Medical Center in LA, uh, United States, uh, Dr. Jamie Justice from Wake Forest University and the X Prize, uh, and also Dr. Uh, Elizabeth Rodriguez from uh, Complutense University in Madrid. So we have a great panel uh, next time, and we are you're all invited to participate. And thank you again to our uh, speaker for this great presentation. And we hope to see you again in our next frailty seminar series. Take care. See you thank later. You. Take bye care. Bye bye. Bye bye.